Good morning. We welcome you in Jesus' name to our service this morning. Uh, this is July 19th, and we pray that you uh, feel the presence of the Lord in your life, and we pray that as we worship Him, that He may be honored and glorified by what comes from our lips and our hearts, and that we might hear from Him in His Word today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the privilege of being together, and we pray your blessing over this worship service. We pray for all those who will be a part of it, that you would uh, be honored by uh, their worship of you. We pray that your spirit would come and speak to us uh, through your word today. Thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My family and I are going to read a responsive reading. It's taken from Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The first song we're going to sing together is a beautiful hymn of the church called Fairest Lord Jesus. Fairest Lord Jesus, good singing. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Let me put this down for a second. Genesis chapter 4, we're, we're continuing our study in the book of Genesis. Did I say Genesis chapter 4? It Genesis chapter 5. We did Genesis chapter 4 last Sunday. He's thinking, or you're thinking, maybe pastor's going to speak on the same thing. Uh, Genesis chapter 5, and this is really the story of the genealogy of the children of Seth. So let's read it together. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, 
He made them in the, in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. For Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his likeness after his image and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Adam that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years, and he begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalaleel. After he begot Mahalaleel, Canaan lived 840 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. Mahalaleel lived 65 years and begot Jarrett. After he begot Jarrett, Mahalaleel lived 830 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahaleliel were 895 years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and he begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. And after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years, and he begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech, or so Methuselah, were 969 years, and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and begot a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands, because of the ground, uh, because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. We pray your blessing over your word today. Uh, strengthen us now by your spirit that we may learn some things through this genealogy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we begin today, I'm going to ask you, uh, these are some old jingles from days gone by, and maybe it will reveal your age to see if you know these. I have three of them here. I'm going to say the first half of it, see if you can figure out the second half of it, and what the company was that was actually doing the jingle, okay? The first one goes like this. You can trust your car. Do you know the rest of it? You can trust your car. The rest of it is to the man who wears the star, the big, bright Texaco star. You knew that one, didn't you? Here's another one. When you care enough, and the rest of it is to send the very best. And of course, it's Hallmark cards, right? Here's the third one. It takes a licking. What's the rest? And keeps on ticking. That's Timex. Remember Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom? All right, anyway. Lots of lots of phrases that we use. But when we think about trusting and we're thinking about um, caring enough, the passage of Scripture before us tells us about a God who cares for us, and, and we'll see that in here. And uh, my sermon today is really, uh, it's really kind of about numbers. You know I've taught mathematics for 13 plus years, so I love numbers, and this particular passage has plenty of numbers in it. So I'm actually entitled my message this, How Old is the Earth? 
how old is the earth? Okay, so I have some points to make. My first point is this. I would ask this question, is the Bible true? Is the Bible true? Uh, and what we've seen in the last, especially uh, about 20, 30, 40 years, is that the idea that science is all-knowing and has proven the age of the earth. And usually today, today's scientists, at least those who uh, are an evolutionary scientist, they pit science against scripture. And if they do that, who wins? Where do we get the idea of millions of years? Is that number of years ever in the Bible? No, it's from evolutionary theorists. Science is seen as opposed to the Bible. It's interesting if you note the history of science uh, that somehow naturalists today say, well, look at science never believed in creation, when in reality there were uh, loads and loads of scientists who did believe they were creation scientists. I'll give you a few illustrations. Here, uh, I have a list before me. I didn't use them all today, but I'm going to use just a few. 41 different disciplines in science that were created by creation scientists. You know, the, the modernists today would say, well, you know, creation scientists aren't real, real scientists. Well, here's a few of them. Antiseptic surgery. Antiseptic surgery was uh, founded by Joseph Lister. From 1827 to 1912, he lived. Bacteriology was founded by a man named Louis Pasteur, where we get pasteurization. From 1822 to 1895, he lived. Calculus was discovered and begun by Isaac Newton, who lived in 1642 to 1727. And here's a fourth one. The laws of thermodynamics were begun by Lord Kelvin, where we get uh, Kelvin, right? How we measure temperature. He lived from 1824 to 1907. Just a few illustrations that science, is, science has not always been opposed to what the Bible says, but that's kind of the atmosphere we're in today. And so we have an idea that from the evolutionary theorists that the world is millions and maybe even billions of years old. All right, so first question I ask is, is the Bible true? The second question I would ask is, does the Bible tell the truth about time? Does the Bible tell the truth about time? And uh, last time we were together, we were in chapter 4, and it was a genealogy of the ungodly seed of Cain. And now when we get to chapter 5, it's like, uh, the first verse says, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam in the days God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. He created him male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. So this is like a new book that's written. Uh, certainly when Moses wrote the scriptures, he had documents that he used, whether it was oral tradition or whether some things were written down. And he's writing down the history of mankind from Adam. And this is now not the ungodly seed of Cain. This is now the replacement for Abel, and that is Seth. And so these are what we call the Sethites, the godly seed. And so we have recorded for us this genealogy. Now, note the pattern. Certainly you realized it as we were reading it. The pattern goes something like this. Uh, God gives the name of a man, and he lived so many years, and he begot, and then we get his son's name, and after he begot the son's name, then, then this person lived so many more years and begot sons and daughters. And so all the days of this man were so many years, and he died. And that's the way this genealogy is written. It recognizes that there was a judgment on sin, and the judgment of sin was death. And so every one of these persons, save one, dies. And that pattern is the same. And so what do we see here? We see uh, from Adam to Noah, 10 generations, 10 generations. Now, help me out here. Um, if you're not a mathematician, you can kind of follow along with me. I'll have this on an outline for you. And so you can look it on the outline. Uh, and the, what we see is when Adam first had his son, and then we don't count necessarily the years after that in order to figure out the total genealogy and the age of the earth. 
but we can see that Adam lived for many, many generations after his son Seth was born. In fact, he saw his great, 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 I think up to like the seventh generation. He lived 800 years after Seth was born. All right, so here, let me just help you out here. So Adam is the first generation. He was 130 when he had Seth. Seth w lived 105 years before he had Enosh. Enosh lived 90 years before he had Canaan. Canaan lived 70 years before he had Mahaleliel. Mahaleliel uh, lived 65 years before he had Jared. Jared lived 162 years before he had Enoch. Enoch lived 65 years before he had Methuselah. Methuselah lived 187 years before he had Lamech. Lamech lived 182 years before he had Noah. All right. So when we add all those together, and then it says Noah was 500 years before he had his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So if we add all those together, and you can do those on your own if you have a calculator, you want to do it, I actually did this by hand. It turns out that all the years from Adam at the beginning of the creation to Noah when he's 500 years old are 1,506 years. 1,506 years, all right? So that's the amount of time we have in these first 10 generations. Now, if you read on, and we'll get to the next chapter and the chapters after that in Genesis, that Noah entered the ark on his 600th year. So basically 100 years after Noah had Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that's when the flood took place. So if we add 100 to 1,506, that is 1,606. So from the beginning of creation till the flood was 1,600 years. 1,600 years. All right. Now, let me do a little more uh, demonstration. That is, in the book of Genesis chapter 11, we have the same type of generations that are given. And it goes from Noah to Ad, uh, Abram or Abraham and his brothers. And those number of years, I won't do that math for you in front of you, but I just know that I added it up and that is another 380 years. So from Adam to Abram, is 1,986 years. 1,986 years, so just under 2,000 years. Now, both, most Bible scholars, me included, believe that Abraham lived about 4,000 years ago. In fact, I do an Old Testament walk through the, walk through the Old Testament, and the, one of the first things I go is 4,000 years. It means 4,000 years ago is when Abraham lived. So if we take to the 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham, and we take the 4,000 years from Abraham to the present day, we have about 6,000 years. 6,000 years. Uh, now, when you check these genealogies against the New Testament account of the life of Jesus, in fact, Jesus has two genealogies. One is kind of selected. It's in Matthew. It has 42 generations from Abraham to Jesus, all right? But in the book of Luke, the second gene genealogy takes us from Jesus and it goes backwards all the way back to Adam. It says the son of Adam who was the son of God. And so there are 76 generations. And yes, those first 10 generations all are listed just as they are listed here in Genesis chapter five. So what do we see here? Does the Bible tell the truth about time. Now, some Bible scholars would say, well, there's a gap in some of these you know, genealogies. I would say, if it's the same in Luke as it is in Genesis, then there's consistency. And that these generations are the actual generations of people who lived back then. Now, some would ask the question, Pastor, how did they live so much longer back before the flood than they do now? Well, the Lord said during, right before he brought the flood on that man's life would be 120 years. And if you study American, or you study uh, the oldest people on the earth today, you know, they come up to about 115, 116 years old. They keep track of those people. 
and they, about the, they don't la last longer than 120 years. But the oldest man that lived was Methuselah. He lived 969 years. Wow. And so, depending on if you think the average age of a person is 80 or if the maximum age of a person today is 120, the people in the time before the flood lived somewhere between 8 and 12 times as long as we live today. Wow. There are several reasons why we might think that. One is because there is one theory, it's called a canopy theory, which says there was a firmament above, it says that in Genesis chapter 1, above the sky, and if it was a water-type canopy, it might have kept the ultraviolet rays from coming down and being destructive on man's skin and, and aging him prematurely. There are other things said to say, too, and that is, obviously, in the early days, uh, genetic um, mutation wasn't going on. Adam was perfect, and then sin came in the world, and we've had the results of sin that have continued on, so that mankind is plagued by all the different maladies that we have because of the multitude of sin that's been added on and the multitude of generations. So early on, those, generation, those generations did not have the mutations. They may have lived longer as well. By the way, just an aside, this isn't part of my message, but if you have animals today that grow all their life, meaning from the time they're born, they continue to grow until they die. And if mankind lived from 8 to 12 times as long as they do now, back then, before the flood, what about those animals that lived pre-flood? If they lived 8 or 12 times as long as they do now, and they continued to grow, how big would they be? Something to think about. Anyway, what we see here is we see that the Bible doesn't give us an indication that there are millions of years. It gives us an indication that there are thousands of years. In fact, only about 6,000 years. Now, there's other illustrations outside the Bible. I want to give a couple this morning. One is the illustration from the Jewish calendar. Now, the Jewish calendar purports to have started at the, the time of the first day of creation. The time of the first day of creation. And their date is uh, the creation of the world was 3,761, 3761. And they don't call it before Christ. They call it BCE, which means before common era. They don't want to mention Christ. So they, they get Christ out of the, uh, the whole way of numbering the years. But 3761 BCE to them, and now it's been 2020 after ACE, which is after the common era. They don't want to mention Jesus. You know, we say A.D., which means in the year of our Lord. It's all about Jesus in uh, how we number the years. But they don't like that. Anyway, um, that adds up to this year presently, 2020 in our calendar, in the Jewish calendar, is the year 5780. 5780. They don't even add up to 6,000. They think the world is less than 6,000 years old. Now, I'm not sure how many Jews actually, you know, actually hold to that view, but that's their calendar. Their calendar says the world is only 5,780 years old. Um, I was reading someone named Bodhi Hodge, who is a, a scientist, and he was talking about his ancestry, and he said there, it, there is recorded ancestry all the way back to Adam, and for his generations, there are only 87 generations from Adam to him. Wow. So they keep track of their genealogy. And part of that is uh, he's English, and you know the English kings, they, they trace their genealogy way back. The royalty traces it way, way back. And so we see here that this generation is possible. Is it plausible that the world is only 6,000 years old? What we see here in this passage of Scripture from chapter 4 and chapter 5, in chapter 4 of our text, um, it's the generation of the descendants of Cain, the Cainites. And they're the wicked generation. And then in chapter 5, we have the descendants of Seth, the Sethites. And they're the godly generation. And it's interesting to note here that we have 
um, this, in the seventh generation of Cain, there is a heightened understanding. And the person that's mentioned is a man named Lamech. It's a different Lamech than in Seth's genealogy. But remember we read from last week that, that Lamech actually said, I've killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. That in essence, the height of wickedness is seen in the seventh generation. Remember, seven is a number of completeness. So in the seventh generation of uh, Cain is Lamech, and Lamech sought revenge. But now we turn to the godly generation, the generation of Seth, and we have one exception to the whole uh, scope of how we said it. Remember we had kind of like the pattern that this man lived, he had a son, and then he had other sons and daughters who lived so many years, then he died. But in the seventh generation of the godly seed is a man named Enoch. And this is Enoch again from the Seth generation. Uh, generations, the Seth genealogy. And let's read what it said again. And this was different than the other ones. Um, It says in verse 21, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. But then it changes. Notice what it says here. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and begot sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And we would think, okay, now it's going to say, and he died. (laughs) But that's not what it says. It says this, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So two different times in this little uh, story of Enoch, it says uh, in verse 22, After he begot Enoch, or after he begot Methuselah, rather, Enoch walked with God. And then again in verse 24, it says, and Enoch walked with God. What a beautiful picture that in the midst of all these generations, uh, we see this one who had a perfect, not a perfect, but a beautiful and intimate relationship with God. And his name was Enoch. And he's the seventh generation. So it's like the number of completeness. Some have even suggested he lived 365 years, that that's symbolic. I don't think it's symbolic, but it's a beautiful thing to think that there are 365 years in a a calendar year. And God, in essence, said, here's the completeness, a man who walked with me. And what happened to this Enoch? It said, Enoch walked with God in verse 24, and he was not, for God took him. He was not like all the rest who died. In fact, in the history of mankind, there are only two people who did not experience death like the rest of humanity. And who are they? Well, Enoch is one. You know who the other one is? The other one is Elijah. You remember Elijah the prophet, that he actually was taken up to heaven on a chariot of fire. So Enoch and Elijah were ones who did not actually experience death. I believe that uh, in the book of Revelation, when there are two prophets that speak for God who end up being killed, that those two prophets are probably Enoch and Elijah. So they're going to experience death like we have, but it's just still in a future tense. So what do we see here? What a beautiful picture of the seventh generation of the godly seed. It's a man, Enoch, who did not seek revenge, but who sought God. Enoch sought God. He walked with God. And what a beautiful picture for us that that's what we can do as well. So I asked the question, uh, is the Bible true? The second question I ask is, does the Bible tell the truth about time? And uh, my, my belief is this, that yes, the Bible does tell us the truth about time. So the third question I would ask this is this. Does the Bible tell the truth about sin and grace? Does the Bible tell the truth about sin and grace? Well, we've seen so far as we've been going through the book of Genesis, we've seen that mankind was created perfectly. Genesis chapter 1, the world. Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve uh, created for one another and created without sin to walk in the garden. Chapter 3. We have the fall of mankind, that man falls into sin. He doesn't believe what God says, and he acts in disobedience. Chapter 4 is the story of Cain killing his brother Abel. 
that sin continues to multiply. And then we have in the end of chapter 4, the generations of Cain's uh, family. And we see that sin is continuing to be present. And certainly it's present in the life of Seth and his family, and there is a need for a Savior. And way back in chapter 3, right after man had sinned, we have the promise of the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. And that is God's statement, Old Testament statement, about grace. Now when we get to the New Testament, the Bible says this. Well, in Isaiah it says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. And Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so we see that the question of sin and the problem of sin are answered by God sending his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is God's answer to the problem of sin. That Jesus came as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And so we can trust what the Bible says about time, but even in a deeper and more a fuller sense for us. We can trust what the Bible says about sin and about grace. And so I pray for you today that as you hear this message, you would believe the Bible from the very first verse and believe that what the Bible says about the beginning of time and the beginning of all creation and then believe what the Bible says about sin, that we are a sinner in need of grace and that God has provided that grace in Jesus Christ. So let's rejoice today in this genealogy, not be bogged down by the numbers and the names, but be rejoicing that God had a way for mankind to be saved. And it would be through the seed of the woman, the seed of Eve. And so this genealogy, this genealogy that's in Genesis is also in Luke because it brings us all the way to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. Let's rejoice in that today. You see, God cared enough to send the very best. It was Jesus. And we can trust our lives to the one who bore the cross, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today, and we pray your blessing to this, for this word to our hearts today. May we rejoice in our Savior. May we look to your word and know that it is true. And let us put all of who we are, our very eternal destiny, into your hands because you tell the truth about all of life, including about sin and our need of grace. Strengthen us now to believe you once again today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We like to sing together a number of songs. The first song is number 262, Trusting Jesus.
this song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, number 235. Thank you for that good singing. We're going to turn together to prayer, and we want to pray for the requests that we have. Sorry, I'm off the camera right now, but we want to pray for the requests that we have. And uh, we mentioned last week that uh, we had heard from Sharon Gruff about her brother, uh, Nick Ordenoff, who is uh, having stage four brain tumor. And so, Lord, we pray for him and we want to pray for our other requests today. So let's turn to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you today for the privilege of being together. We thank you, Lord God, that we can look to you for our answers for all of life because your word is true. And when we think about even how old the world is, according to the genealogies, that's how old the world is, about 6,000 years. And for all of those years, God, you have been our God. You have been the one who has been there and been a refuge and a strength, a very present help in trouble. And so today, Lord God, we pray that as we come before you, that we would seek to adore you and exalt you as the God who loves us and cares for us, and the God who created us, and the God who saved us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross, and the one who one day will redeem us and bring us to glory to be with you forever. Father, I would pray today for our country as we are in the midst of many, many things. And Lord, we pray that law and order 
and righteousness and justice would win out in these days. I pray, Lord God, that there would be a secession of all the hostilities that are going on between people. Lord, I pray that there may be a stopping of all the looting and the rioting and the destruction that's going on. And Lord God, I pray that there may be law and order again. I pray for those in leadership over us. I pray for our president and for the Supreme Court, for the Congress. I pray for the, the governors of the different states. I pray for the mayors of our cities. I pray that you bring them wisdom as they make decisions regarding our country. Lord God, I would pray today for those who are sick amongst us. I would pray today for Art Ray as he continues to go through chemotherapy. I would pray for Sharon Gruff's brother, Nick Ordinoff, who has stage four brain tumor. Lord God, I pray that you would minister to his life. I pray that you'd minister to Sharon's life as she walks together with him through this. Lord God, there are many other requests that we would have today. I would pray for um, our friends who minister in El Salvador, the Caleros. Bless their ministry there. Strengthen them by your spirit to walk with you, and may you give open doors of opportunity. And Lord, for the, all of us who hear this message today, I pray that you would meet our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. May we be faithful to you in giving and being a part of the church. May we give as you have blessed us, God, and may we be faithful in that. And Lord, may you as the God who has always been there provide for us our daily bread. We rejoice in you today, Lord, and we thank you for this time together. And we pray your blessing over these requests and, and many others that maybe not have been verbalized, but certainly on our hearts. I pray that you'd meet those needs as well. Thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive the benediction and we will sing the doxology. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.